aware that Lear is about to begin negotiations on a peace treaty, Eaton and his army begin their 60-mile march to Derna. On the afternoon of April 25th, the army arrives outside the city. In his journal, Eaton describes the strategic situation that awaits them. The city was divided into three departments, two of which were in the interest of Hammett and one in opposition. This department, though fewest in number, was strongest in position and resource. Eaton learns there are 800 soldiers here ready to defend their town. To his great relief, Yusuf's army has not yet arrived. Undoubtedly, the decision was made at that point that they would attack uh, on the right flank first because <clears throat> that was closest to where the, the major fortification of Derna was. And obviously, if you could take that out, you kind of knocked out the keystone. April 27th, 1805. By early afternoon, Eaton is in position to attack the city. Commodore Barron has authorized three U.S. naval ships from the Mediterranean fleet to assist Eaton. The bombardment will come from the 16-gun brig Argus, the 12-gun schooner Nautilus, and the 10-gun sloop Hornet. The strategy was a two-pronged attack, one from the shore that Eaton and the Arabian cavalry would provide, and one from the harbor that the uh, Hornet, Nautilus, and Argus would provide. Marine Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon will lead the Christian soldiers, a small force of barely 70 men against the defending army of 800 amassed near Derna's Stonewater Battery. Hammett would take the rest of his people over on the left flank, and they would cut off retreat, because that was the side from which loyalists in the town would attempt to get back into the desert and over toward Tripoli. The cannon on the city's water battery fire the first shots, attacking the U.S. Navy ships. The American Navy bombardment of the city of Derna was horrifying and was awesome. It frightened many people and led to the death of many, many people of that city. The Hornet was about 100 yards from the walls of the town and just pouring broadside after broadside into the, into the town. As the American ships attack from the water, Eaton's army begins the land assault. The defenders in the fortified city let loose a blistering hail of gunfire. On the southwest side of town, Hammett and his cavalry charge towards the governor's palace. As the naval bombardment took effect, the gunners were leaving the water battery, and a major portion of them apparently came to the walls on the south side of the town. In other words, they were reinforcing the people opposite Heaton. Heaton and his men are under increasingly heavy fire. Outnumbered 10 to 1, his small army is beginning to fall apart. North Africa. William Eaton, his small force of eight Marines, and his Arab mercenary army are fighting for control of Derna. Cannon fire from the three Navy ships overpowers the enemy guns on the water battery. But in the hills just east of the city walls, Eaton's small army is under increasingly heavy gunfire. must be decisive in his commands. The, the firing went on and on. He could see he was losing his men. He could see that if he did nothing, they would, uh, he would lose them. There would be no attack. In his journal, Eaton describes the chaos. Our troops were thrown into confusion. 
and undisciplined as they were, it was impossible to reduce them to order. I perceived a charge our last and only resort. Presley O'Bannon are in the lead as their army charges across open ground towards the fortified walls of the city. The charge cannot be done without casualties. One Marine was killed outright, a second one was mortally wounded, and two others were wounded. But, and, and up to nine of the, the Christians we know of were also hit. Basketball slams into Eaton's left arm, shattering his wrist. Marine Lieutenant Presley O'Bannon keeps up the charge. His group of mercenaries and American Marines were able to storm right through the town after this initial repulse and just took everything before them. Marines storm the water battery. With support from the U.S. Navy ships, Eaton and the Marines capture the most heavily fortified section of the city. In the moment of conquest, O'Bannon plants the American flag. I don't think that raising the American flag over Derna was a very wise uh, decision by Eaton that time. Especially if you are bringing a, a prince from the Carmanli family and you want to support a legitimate heir to the throne. Hamid and his army of several hundred Arab cavalry charge into the southwestern side of town. With almost no opposition, they seize the governor's palace. Four o'clock, the fight is over. The Americans have conquered Derna. Battle of Derna was the first time that the United States had launched a, a coordinated land sea attack with uh, naval vessels providing covering fire for a land forces moving in from another direction. I don't think this had ever happened in US history. For seven weeks, William Eaton has rallied an army of mercenaries who have little allegiance to his true cause. He has marched them more than 500 miles across the brutal Egyptian desert. He has quelled mutinies and overcome starvation to launch an unprecedented attack on a hostile country. And in just over two hours, outnumbered 10 to 1, William Eaton has won his first battle against Tripoli. was Americans going back to the old world to show them that we were forced to be reckoned with and we wouldn't sit idly by while our ships were taken and their crews imprisoned. We call this place Fort Enterprise. Our first conquest in our war on Tripoli. My brother will be most alarmed when he learns we have... Though Eaton has control of Derna, the loyal subjects he had expected to flock to Hamid are few. Hammett never assumed real control, and everyone knew it, because what Eaton had were guns and money. He controlled the ultimate power in Derna. I think as time passed, they recognized that this battle didn't settle the war. This didn't get Hammett really necessarily any closer to being back on the throne, and there was really no visible support. But Eaton is determined to continue his attack on Tripoli. He immediately writes to Naval Commodore Samuel Barron and asks for money, weapons, and supplies. You would weep, sir, were you on the spot, to witness the unbounded confidence in the American character here. We only want a few Marines to proceed to Tripoli for the liberation of our captives. Twelve days after Eaton has taken power in Derna, Yusuf's army arrives on the outskirts of the city. For a week, they sit and watch the town, waiting for the right opportunity to attack. Then, on May 
May 14th, Yusuf's army launches into battle. force on horseback charged right into the heart of the city. Their goal is to capture him, or either capture or kill him, because they knew if they did that, uh, this insurgency would be over. But a barrage of cannon fire from the Navy ships and the water battery quickly beats back the cavalry. are again victorious. June 1st, 1805. Eaton has held power in Derna for one month when a letter arrives from Commodore Barron. Eaton anticipates praise for his victories and a promise for money and reinforcements. The letter contains neither. The want of those qualities so essential in the character of a prince contending for his throne is a serious obstacle to the advancement of his cause. His Excellency must be explicitly informed that our supplies of money, arms, and provisions are at an end. Eaton is crushed. He has tasted victory. Now, his plan to free the Americans in Tripoli is falling apart. William Eaton has fought and won the battle for Derna, but he is far from winning the war against Tripoli. He has controlled Derna for a month, but still hasn't received the money and supplies needed to continue his mission. On June 1st, Eaton receives a devastating letter from U.S. Naval Commodore Samuel Barron. Barron will no longer support Eaton's plan to free the American hostages by putting Hammond back in power in Tripoli. I can well imagine he was gnashing his teeth, shall we say, uh, frustrated, recognizing that all this had probably been for nothing, that it wasn't going to go any farther. Eaton keeps the news a secret, even from his own men. If he tells Hammett, he fears everything will fall apart. Then, on June 11, 1805, at six in the evening, the Navy warship Constellation sails along the coast of North Africa and into Derna Harbor. On board the ship, Eaton receives a letter from American diplomat Tobias Lear. On June 3rd, 1805, Lear signed a peace treaty with Hammett's brother Yusuf, the ruler of Tripoli. The United States government has agreed to pay $60,000 for the release of the 300 American prisoners. There will be no annual tribute. And that's when we simply abandon Hammett. It wasn't our goal to overthrow Yusuf or to put Hammett on the throne. Hammett was only useful to us in as much as we could use him to get our prisoners free. Thank you. In another letter, the Commodore of the Naval Fleet orders Eaton to immediately withdraw his men and evacuate Derna. It is the end of Eaton's mission. I think Eaton, for the rest of his life, was terribly frustrated uh, and felt that he'd been betrayed, perhaps, even, by his country. 